Hello? Okay. So, uh, first slide. Okay. I'm Bob Zubrin. I'm an astronautical engineer. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, about how I think we can get uh, people to Mars. Uh, either uh, within 10 years from now or 10 years from whenever anybody turns on the money. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, reflects work uh, that I did when I was uh, working for the Martin Company uh, as an astronautical engineer. That is my uh, profession. Uh, and I don't work for them anymore. I have my own company now. But uh, while I was there, I was able to take advantage of their resources to put together these terrific charts. And um, one of the great benefits of working for the Martin Company is that when you quit, you get to keep your charts. And so I figured I'd use them in the presentation tonight because to this afternoon rather because after all you did pay for them uh, okay so I'm going to talk at some length about how humans have explored the earth and uh, although uh, I talk about it in a lot more length in my book which if you're interested in after the talk I'll be signing them in the in the back at the at the table there you could find out more about it uh, uh, but before I talk about how humans have explore, can explore Mars, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about how humans have explored on the Earth. Because I believe it's only by looking at how humans have successfully explored on the Earth that you can develop intelligent plans for how we can explore on other worlds. So I can have the next chart. Okay. This here is a uh, photograph of one of the great uh, ships in the history of human exploration of the Earth. Now she doesn't look like, like a great ship. You can see how diminutive this vessel is by the two people standing next to her over here. And yet it is one of the great ships, despite the fact that if you cut off you know, her mast and bowsprit, you could put her inside of the space shuttle payload bay. This, literally, that's true. This is the Yoa. This is the ship that Captain Amundsen used to do the first successful Northwest Passage. Now, in many respects, this mission was a lot like the first human mission to Mars might be. First of all, it was three years in duration, which is comparable to the length of the first round trip to Mars is, is likely to take. The crew was a crew of six, not 60, not 600, just six people, which is about the size uh, that we're likely to have on the first uh, human trips to Mars. Uh, the living quarters within the Yoa, the, for, for, for three long Arctic winters, they had to live below decks on the Yoa within quarters that are actually smaller than the living quarters on the space shuttle and a lot more uncomfortable. Uh, so in terms of um, the human factors challenges of the Mars mission, duration, social space, physical space, they took them all on and passed with flying colors and that's of some interest. Uh, because there's been a lot of whining about the great human factors barrier to a piloted Mars mission. But I think if you look at previous generations of explorers or many other challenging experiences that people have undertaken, such as soldiers in combat, prisoners in prisons, refugees in hiding, um, what you find is that the, the human factors challenge presented by this project is comparatively modest and that far from being the weak link in the chain of the piloted Mars mission, the human psyche is likely to be the strongest link in the chain. Okay. But th that's fairly interesting, but what's really important about all this? Well, the thing that's really important about all this is that while this was the first successful Northwest Passage, it was by no means the first attempt. In fact, there had been over a hundred previous attempts. Next chart. And every single one of them failed. And the interesting thing is that of these hundred uh, previous attempts, every single one of them was done on a scale at least an order of magnitude greater than the Amundsen expedition, and in some cases two orders of magnitude greater, in terms of any measure of mission heft that you would choose to define, such as size of the crew, tonnage of the vessels, the amount of money behind the expedition, the number of people involved in planning the expedition. They were all one to two orders of magnitude greater, and they failed. And it was the shoestring expedition that succeeded. Now, I mean, in the 19th century alone, the British Navy alone tried 30 times. Okay. And they didn't do it with an old sealing boat like Amundsen. They did it with fleets of steam-powered warships supported by convoys of supplied vessels and planned the whole thing years in advance with the aid of the largest planning bureaucracy in the world at the time, the British Admiralty, and they failed every time. Okay. They'd steam into the Arctic, breaking ice, until eventually they'd get frozen in. Then they'd eat their way into their several hundred tons of supplies that they had brought along 
several hundred tons of salt pork. And then they, uh, in the spring perhaps, would break out and make some more progress and then get frozen in again. Uh, and repeat the process for two winters, three winters, in one case five winters, until eventually supplies ran out and a command decision would have to be made uh, to head for home. And in general they did make it home, but in no case did they succeed in doing the Northwest Passage. Now Amundsen was frozen in for two years on King William Island, which is the exact same island in the Canadian Arctic that Sir John Franklin and his two steam frigates and 127 men were frozen in in 1847. Now the Franklin expedition, shown here, perished to the man. They ate their way through their 300 tons of salt pork. They had no supplies, so they tried to escape to the south, uh, but they, 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 they couldn't do it. Uh, and, and they dropped in their tracks man-hauling sledges filled with their valuables. And uh, some of you, no doubt, probably remember in the 1980s, Franklin's men were finally dug out of the ice, uh, together with several crates of very fine Victorian china that they had <laughs> managed to say. Um, Okay. Now, Amundsen was frozen in, in the same place, for a longer period of time than it took the Franklin expedition to disintegrate. But he and his men did not starve to death on King William Island. In fact, they got fat. Really, they actually gained weight on King William Island. Okay, Eating caribou, which abound in the area. Because the Amundsen expedition did not go into the Arctic with 300 tons of salt pork. The little Yoa couldn't have carried it, and he couldn't have afforded it. His expedition was done on private money. It had to be what you might call a pork-free mission. <laughs> what, what, what they did was they went into the Arctic with half a dozen hunting rifles and several cases of ammunition and men who knew how to use it. And they brought something else. They brought dogs and dog sleds and men who knew how to use them, which is an art in itself. Uh, and the dogs are essential to give you the mobility which is required to hunt the very mobile herds of caribou. And of course, they could be fed off the same resource. And what this combination allowed Amundsen to do was uh, live off the land. And not only that, not just survive and do the Northwest Passage successfully on a shoestring budget, uh, but even do some real exploration. He did not spend his two Arctic summers that he was frozen in on King William sitting on the deck of the Yoa staring at the ice praying for it to break up. He and his crew spent their time traveling hundreds of miles all over the Arctic via dog sled. Hunting, yes, but also exploring. And they discovered that Earth's magnetic poles move. That is an important discovery in geophysics. It was made by Amundsen and it was only possible to be made by Amundsen because of this extremely potent travel light and live off the land approach to exploration that he took. So what the moral of the story here is, is if you look at the history of human exploration of the Earth, it has been shown, in fact, repeatedly, that it is possible for a small group of people operating on a shoestring budget to succeed brilliantly in carrying out a program of exploration when numerous others with vastly greater resources behind them have repeatedly failed, provided that the small group makes intelligent use of the resources that are available in the environment they intend to operate in. That's the Amundsen story, that's Lewis and Clark's story. Crossed the American continent with 25 men, when previous to them, armies with huge baggage trains had failed to make any significant penetration whatsoever, precisely because of the huge baggage trains. So, how does this relate to Mars? Next chart. Let's move ahead in time to 1989. President George Bush gets up on the steps of the National Air and Space Museum, flanked by Armstrong and Aldrin and Collins, the Apollo 11 crew, and he says, this is the 20th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. That was great. That's what America is all about. And therefore, I, as president, are committing us to go back to the moon and on to Mars, and this time to stay. It's great stuff. So he started this program that became eventually known as the Space Exploration Initiative. And what happened next? NASA the space agency went off to conduct a study on how this might be accomplished. And they came back three months later with a report which therefore became known officially as the 90-day report. And they said, George, we can do it. We can get you to Mars. We require a 30-year timeline and a budget of $450 billion. But if you can give us that, we're ready to rock. <laughs> And this is the sort of thing they came up with. Uh, this, what you see here, is an interplanetary spaceship. I call it the Death Star. <laughs> it weighs a thousand tons. 
which is about the payload the United States has launched cumulatively to orbit since 1975. It's 100 meters long, big as a football field. It's got one, two, three, four, five big tanks of liquid hydrogen here, each weighing 150 tons. So each of those would have to be launched or to orbit separately by a launch vehicle with the capability of a Saturn V moon rocket. That would take about a year, during which time a significant fraction of the hydrogen would boil away. But put that problem aside, because they got other problems. They got two nuclear rocket engines, which with each was 75,000 pounds of thrust, and as much as I'd love to have them, they don't exist. Okay? <laughs> and here, okay, this truss here, uh, so th which would have to be built in space, would therefore have to take the same load as a truss standing vertically on the surface of the Earth with 75 cars stacked on top of it. Okay, and you'd have to have all sorts of cryogenic lines and electrical connects and everything up and down it. And then there up front's the payload. It's kind of complicated. We won't even talk about it, except to note that it's positioned behind a 100-foot diameter aero shell, which is much too big to fit inside of the launch fairing of any launch vehicle that anyone's willing to discuss. So that would have to be uh, built on orbit with all the structural integrity of an aero shell that's going to hit Mars's atmosphere at Mach 30. And uh, in fact, the whole vehicle obviously has to be built on orbit because if you tried to build a launch vehicle that could launch this in one piece, you'd blow away Orlando when it took off. <laughs> so indeed, uh, it could be built on orbit. Next chart. In 10 easy steps, as illustrated here, provided you had available to you uh, orbiting hangars, construction docks, power generation stations, cryogenic fuel depots, checkout points, crew construction shacks, an entire paraphernalia of orbiting infrastructure that collectively I call the parallel universe. <laughs> okay. So that, that's the 90 day report plan. Okay, you spent $450 billion to build the parallel universe. This, by the way, is why parallel universes are not generally observed. It's, it's not because they are physically impossible. It is the financial problem of creating them. <laughs> okay, the, uh, anyway, because uh, physicists have shown that parallel universes is, is straightforward. Uh, the, uh, okay, so you build the parallel universe, and then you build the Death Star, and you sail it off to Mars, all for just half the cost and current money of the U.S. war effort in World War II. Uh, so, uh, a number of us engineers at Martin were aware of what was in the 90-day report before it came out, as I think a lot of people in the industry were. Uh, and we went to management and we said, look, uh, this is not going to work. Okay, we could give you a whole bunch of technical reasons why this won't work, but you wouldn't understand that. Actually, we left that part out. Uh, uh, no, sir. But even you, I mean, actually, no, we said it more like, but you can certainly understand, okay, that nobody is going to give them 30 years and $450 billion in order to do this, okay? And, uh, you know, those of you who are acquainted with, you know, upper management in corporate America can readily appreciate the fact that the management of Martin Marietta uh, is or was composed exclusively of brilliant visionaries with lightning quick minds. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, so they said, um, well, let's wait and see. Uh, so they waited and they saw, and the 90-day report went down like a lead balloon in Congress, and then we had a lot of credibility, and so they came up to us and they said, well, what do you want to do anyway, smarty pants? And uh, then they well, we said, well, we want to do, okay, is we want to put together our own team of engineers right here within the company with a charter to come up with a clean sheet approach of how to get humans to Mars. And here's the deal. We don't want to have a bunch of managers or marketeers or people like this coming in here and telling us we got to design the mission this way or that way because we know this guy down at the Johnson Space Center or the Marshall Space Flight Center or someplace who's pushing this technology or that technology and they really want to see it included in the mission. Uh, we don't want to have that because, you see, that's what had driven the 90-day report so berserk. It wasn't that the people who designed that mission plan were stupid. Individually, almost all the people involved in the 90-day report effort were extremely intelligent and competent engineers. Just collectively, they were a nuthouse. Okay? <laughs> because what they were trying to do was they ended up designing the most complicated mission they possibly could in order to make everyone's technology mission critical, which is the exact opposite of the correct way to do engineering. Okay. So it was going to be hard enough to come up with an attractive plan for human exploration of Mars without being driven by such imperatives. So they said, okay, you're on. Okay. So we put together a team of people, just 12 people within the whole Martin company, and I was one of them. Uh, 
to, to do this. And because there were a lot of uh, creative spirits on this team, uh, we could not agree with each other. And so we actually came up with three different plans. And uh, rather than reconcile them, which was impossible, we chose to float them all to NASA in the spring of 1990. And it rapidly became clear that the Mars Direct Plan, which I was largely responsible for along with another fellow named David Baker, uh, had the most potential for overthrowing the situation. It was by far the most radical departure from this kind of thinking and that involved no on-orbit assembly, no use of the space station actually, uh, no orbital rendezvous of any kind, no use of advanced propulsion, uh, and yet it was the nearest term uh, form of mission. And, uh, that uh, that it had the most potential for overthrowing things and it was attracting a great deal of support and a great deal of heated opposition. Uh, but um, before I, I, I go into any further discussion of, of the political evolution of it, I'm, I'm, I'm now going to talk about the plan itself. What was this new and totally different approach to Mars, the Mars Direct Plan? Next chart. Okay. Well, any uh, space plan has got to have a launch vehicle. And so we designed one, which we called the Ares, after the uh, Greek name for uh, Mars. And the Ares was basically a junkyard special. That is, it's built of things that are either in junkyards today or, frankly, really should be. <laughs> um, okay. Now, the, and the purpose of designing the vehicle that way is simply this. Okay, this is what has to be understood if you're going to design a plan to get humans to Mars. That the problem of getting humans to Mars is fundamentally the same strategic problem as that facing the children of Israel in attempting to cross the Red Sea. Okay, that is, here's your problem. You're trying to get somewhere. There's this impassable obstacle in front of you. It cannot be traversed. Then all of a sudden, a miracle happens. Moses parts the waters. Bush gives a speech. Now there's two cliffs of water standing there with a path of dry land between them. Okay, you can get across. But you cannot do this on a 30-year timeline. Okay. <laughs> Okay, because the Egyptians are behind you. Okay, you know, DeMille's special effects budget is limited. Okay, you know, God's patience isn't infinite and the U.S. Congress is worse. So, in other words, if in 1961, John F. Kennedy had said, I want to have people on the moon by 1990 instead of by 1970, which is, of course, what he did say, then by 1968, when administrations changed and we were in the middle of the Vietnam War and have a totally different national mood from that of the early 60s, and maybe the space program might have been in the middle of the Mercury flights, people would have said, what the hell is this? And they would have canceled the program and people today would, would be saying that going to the moon was just this impossible dream of this you know, child president and uh, you know, that it was impossible. No. Okay. If you want to go to Mars, you cannot do it in 30 years. You cannot do it in 20 years. If you want to get people to Mars, you've got to do it in 10 years or less. 10 years from when you start the program or less. Otherwise, you are guaranteeing that the waters are going to come together on you before you get across because no consensus can be held together for that long. Okay, so the junkyard special. Okay, what is it made out of? Well, the central object that it's made out of is the shuttle external tank without the O-Jive, which is the conical top of the ET. We don't need that because that's there for aerodynamic reasons. Uh, Okay, and then you have uh, four space shuttle main engines here, okay, uh, hanging off in that pod so you can use the um, shuttle launch pads which have the flame trenches positioned appropriately for that location. Uh, those engines, by the way, are available. They, they're lying around in crates near the Rocketdyne plant in Canoga Park, California, and you can actually get them for free if you go at night because... <laughs> It's true. They've laid off the night watchman. The earthquake took down the fence. It's not a problem. Uh, <laughs> then you got two solid rocket boosters there. People in Utah would be happy to sell them to you. Check the O-rings before deli except delivery. Um, then uh, upstairs is a hydrogen oxygen upper stage. We know how to build that. And on top of that, uh, there's a fairing, a payload envelope, 10 meters in diameter. So it's much fatter than the, the four and a half meter uh, shuttle and Titan IV payload fairings. And, and that's the Ares. Now, people ordinarily rate launch vehicles by what they can lift to low Earth orbit or LEO. And if you want to know, an Ares can lift 121 metric tons to LEO. And that's pretty good. 
It's a lot better than a shuttle, which can do 25 maximum. Uh, it's even a bit better than the Russian Energia, which can do 100. It's a little worse than the Saturn V, which could do 140. But it's basically in the Energia Saturn V class. But like the Saturn V, and unlike, for example, the Space Shuttle, this vehicle has an additional capability. Because it is a staged vehicle, it can use that upper stage to throw payloads far beyond low Earth orbit, to throw them directly into interplanetary space. It can throw 47 tons straight to Mars or 59 to the Moon. And you see, that's how we want to do the pilot of Mars mission. Lift and throw the payload to Mars with the same upper stage or the same booster that lifted it to orbit in the first place. Why? Because that's the way we've done every real unmanned interplanetary mission to date, as well as the manned lunar missions. Okay? Uh, no payload has ever flown beyond G uh, low Earth orbit any other way. No one has ever flown payloads somewhere by lifting it to low Earth orbit, transferring it to the station, waiting for the interplanetary battle cruiser to check in from its Saturn flight, get refueled and take it out again. No, if you can do this mission with a simple lift and throw strategy, you've gone 90% of the way to taking the Mars mission out of the parallel universe and putting it in our universe of brass tacks engineering. Okay, great. But how could you do that? Okay, this can lift 121 tons. The Death Star weighed a thousand. Okay, uh, as I said, a super booster to lift that much is impractical. Well, we could divide it. You know, a thousand by 120 is eight. We could divide the thing into eight payloads, launch them to Mars, rendezvous in various places along the way, or in Mars orbit or somewhere. Uh, and maybe you could fly a mission that way. It'd be pretty complex, but it'd be a pretty bad idea. Because if you have a mission plan that involves eight launches and they're all mission critical and one goes in the drink, you've lost the whole mission. Okay, so that, that's not going to work. Dividing it into two launches and counting on two launches both working, uh, that's uh, uh, reasonable and in fact I do do that in my plan, but that still leaves you 500 tons each. Okay, uh, well what else could you do? Well, um, the NASA mission plan uh, it used what I consider an irrational trajectory, which is known as an opposition class trajectory. They uh, involved a mission which uh, spent around 1.8 years in interplanetary space in two unequal legs, outbound and inbound, and a little less than a month at Mars. Okay, this is known as an opposition class mission. It was designed to meet the NASA figure of merit for the Mars mission, which was minimum time away from Earth. However, the opposition mission First of all, greatly increases mission mass because it has a lot of extra propulsion requirements required to do that trajectory because uh, it's not really a natural trajectory. And uh, another bad feature of it is that it does very little when you get to Mars because you're there for less than a month if the weather is bad, you don't even get to land. And a third disadvantage is you probably kill the crew because you have to do a flyby into the inner solar system on one of the two legs. I call it a Venus flyby uh, <laughs> in, in order to fly the trajectory. Okay, uh, now there's another kind of uh, uh, mission plan, which is known as the conjunction plan, uh, which is the one that I support, which involves taking six months to fly out to Mars. You spend a year and a half on Mars to wait for the proper launch window to arrive to go back to Earth, and then a six-month voyage coming back. So you are away from home for longer than the opposition class mission. You're away from home for two and a half years instead of 1.9 years. But you spend 60% of your mission time on Mars instead of 5%. Okay, and you see, since I consider uh, the purpose of going to Mars to explore Mars as opposed to going there to say you did it, uh, you know, my figure of merit for a Mars mission is person days on Mars divided by tons in low Earth orbit. And the third advantage of this plan is that its propulsion requirements are a lot less than the opposition plan. So if you accept that, and I do, uh, then you use a conjunction class mission, in which case, the, if you had applied that to the, to the NASA plan, the mass of that ship would have dropped from 1,000 tons to 600 tons. Divide that in half, it's 300 tons each. It's almost possible, but still not quite there. What else could you do? Well, you could invoke advanced propulsion. Nuclear propulsion, ion drives, fusion propulsion, your favorite, clearly. Uh, the uh, antimatter. How about warp drive? Uh, teleportation? <laughs> Pixie dust? There's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there that has more capability of chemical propulsion. Okay, and some of it will actually work someday. Nuclear propulsion can certainly be made to work. I mean, we had test engines in the 1960s that worked. But the problem is that it will take too long. 
okay, that if you want to get to Mars in 10 years, you've got to use a propulsion system which is either on the shelf right now or practically so. And therefore, even if, if these other propulsion systems are much more desirable and have all sorts of attractive features, if they won't enable you to get to Mars within this 10-year program window, they're guaranteeing programmatic failure. You're guaranteeing the waters are going to come together on you before you get across. So what else can you do? What we decided to do was use the Amundsen approach. Reduce the mass that you've got to send to Mars by using the mass that's already there. How does this work? Next chart. Okay. Uh, this is the mission sequence chart for the Mars Direct Plan, and I drew this a few years ago. And you'll notice there are some dates up here that are pretty aggressive if you were to take them literally today. Uh, and certainly with the current political configuration, these dates will not be achieved. Uh, however, I leave them up there in order to make the point clear that I am talking about a near-term Mars mission. I'm talking about a Mars mission that can be designed by people who are engineers today and flown by people who are in the astronaut corps today. Okay, uh, you know, I, I'm not talking about a Mars mission that can be flown by Captain Kirk or, you know, Picard. You, actually, you wouldn't want to send Picard to Mars because what would happen is as they got close to Mars, he would turn to Counselor Troy and say, well, what do we do now? And she would say, well, how do you feel? And uh, <laughs> it, it, it just is not what you want. Uh, the, uh, now, I'm talking about a Mars mission that can be flown by us. So. How does it work? In a given year, uh, I'll talk the dates that are on this chart so as not to cause confusion. Uh, you launch one of these boosters off the Cape, and you use that upper stage to throw an unmanned payload weighing around 40 tons to Mars. That takes eight months to fly to Mars on a minimum energy trajectory, and then when it gets to Mars, you use an aero shield to make friction against the Mars' atmosphere, capture yourself into Mars' orbit. That's called aero braking. And then after you check it out and check out the weather, you bring it down and you land it on Mars with a parachute and some retro rockets, just like we did with the Viking mission in 1976. Okay, now what is this thing that we've hand landed on Mars? Go to the next chart, but keep this one aside. We'll need this one again. Okay. What it is, it's the Earth return vehicle. Okay. The Earth return vehicle is basically a little rocket ship. Okay. It's got a little cabin in here with Spartan quarters for a crew of four astronauts who will fly in it for six months from Mars back to Earth later in the mission. But there's nobody in it now. And then we got two methane oxygen chemical propulsion stages here, which however are unfueled. Okay, however, in some of the lower stage tanks that are later going to contain methane, we got around six tons of liquid hydrogen probably in gelled form. And then slung below the vehicle, not shown in this picture, we got a little light truck, like a little pickup truck that uh, runs on a methane oxygen internal combustion engine. And in the back of that truck, we got a little nuclear reactor with a power of around 100 kilowatts. Now what happens is after this thing is landed, the truck is telerobotically driven a couple of hundred yards away from the landing. You've got to drive slow because there's a time lag and radio signals from Earth to Mars, but you got a big wheeled vehicle and you're not going very far. You just drive it slow, unwinding a cable off a windlass on the back of the truck as you go. And then when you get a certain distance away, you lower the reactor off the truck onto the ground, preferably into some crater or a ditch or on the reverse side of the hill, anything to put a nice sized chunk of dirt between it and the main landing area. And then you turn it on, and now you got power at the ship. And what you do then is, next chart, is you go hunting for Martian caribou otherwise known as carbon dioxide molecules. See, Mars has got an atmosphere. It's 95% CO2. We know that for a fact because of the two Viking landers that operated on Mars for several years in the late 1970s. Okay, now CO2 can be reacted with hydrogen in the presence of a catalyst to produce methane, CH4, and water. That's known as the Sabatier reaction. It's been practiced in the chemical industry since the 1890s. Okay, it's, it's gaslight era technology. And it, by the way, it's an exothermic reaction. It requires no power to make it go. It actually releases energy. So you get your natural gas, your rocket fuel, you store that in your tank, that's your fuel to come home, and then you take the water and you electrolyze it into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen you store, that's your oxidizer to burn the methane with, and the hydrogen you recycle to react with more CO2, and round and round you go. Now if you just run those two reactions, you'd end up turning your six tons of hydrogen into 72 tons of methane oxygen by propellant on the surface of Mars. That's a leverage of 12 to 1, that's pretty good. But you can do better than that because the ideal mixture ratio for burning methane with oxygen requires more oxygen than those two reactions alone produce. So you run a third reactor in which you take in CO2 and you split it into carbon monoxide and oxygen directly. You keep the oxygen for more oxidizer and you vent the CO2, the CO rather, as waste. You can do that on Mars. There is no EPA there. <laughs> okay. So when you're all done, okay, 
you've taken your six tons of hydrogen from Earth, you've turned it into 108 tons of methane oxygen bipropellant on the surface of Mars. That's a leverage of 18 to 1. It's like a pioneer being able to acquire the useful mass of a bison for the transportive mass of several bullets and cartridges. And that's what makes the whole mission sing. 95% of the return propellant is coming from Mars, only 5% of it in the form of the hydrogen feedstock is coming from Earth. And because we can make so much propellant, we make extra propellant, which allows us to use on Mars ground vehicles driven on combustion engines, which are going to have a lot more power and mobility than you can get with battery powered vehicles or fuel cell powered vehicles. And that's important too. That's the dog sled, okay? Because, you see, we're not going to Mars to, you know, set a new altitude record for the Aviation Almanac. We're, we're going there to explore a planet and the most important requirement to explore the planet is mobility on the planet and that's what locally produced fuels allow you to do. Next chart. Uh, oh yeah. A lot of times it's easy to write charts like that and show the chemical equations and it all adds up and something else entirely to make it work in practice. That's not the case here. Uh, I can vouch for that because I built a machine that does that chemical synthesis that I just showed you. This is a full scale unit you're looking at. Okay, that I built it uh, Lockheed Martin and uh, by the way at a cost of $47,000 which is undoubtedly the cheapest thing that was ever built at Lockheed Martin. <laughs> and. Uh, and neither I nor Larry Clark, the test engineer shown here, nor anyone else on this project was actually a real chemical engineer. We were just aerospace engineers dinking around. So if we can make this work, and it did work, it was 94% efficient by the way, uh, real chemical engineers can make it work a lot sweeter and lighter and more compact. And uh, there is no doubt that this works. Uh, this is in fact the only part of a piloted Mars mission that, 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 that you can do at home. Um, <laughs> let's go back to the mission sequence chart. Okay, so we flew this thing to Mars. It took eight months to get to Mars. It took 10 months to make the propellant. That's 18 months. There's 26 months in between launch windows from Earth to Mars. So long before the next launch window has opened up, we will know that we have a fully fueled Earth return vehicle waiting for us on the surface of Mars. And that being the case, in the next launch window, we launch two more boosters off the Cape. One sends out another one of these Earth return vehicle fuel factory deals. The other one sends out a habitat with a crew of four astronauts in it. Now, because our return ride is waiting for us on the surface of Mars, we don't have to fly to Mars in the Death Star. Okay? We don't even have to fly to Mars in the Millennium Falcon. We can fly to Mars in, next chart, a tuna can. <laughs> Okay, which is a big advantage because we know how to build tuna cans and they have been proven in commerce to be an extremely efficient shape for volumetric packaging. Uh, although this one is uh, somewhat larger than the standard chicken of the sea model. It's 27 feet in diameter and 16 feet tall so it's got two decks each with eight feet of headroom. The upper deck is where people actually live. The lower deck is more of a garage, cargo hold, workshop kind of area. Next chart. Here's the upper deck of the hab. Uh, you can see there's little stateroom for each of four astronauts. There's a science lab, an exercise area, a galley, and in the center is a uh, solar flare storm shelter. Okay. Uh, briefly, uh, I think a lot of people here may know this, but th there's two kinds of radiation that can get you in interplanetary space. There's solar flares and there's cosmic rays. They're very different from each other. Solar flares are uh, events that originate in the sun with a huge rush of radiation that can deliver thousands of rems in the course of a few hours, which is enough to kill an unshielded astronaut uh, in, in fairly short order. Okay, that's bad. And they occur at an unpredictable basis, perhaps one big one a year. Uh, Okay, so that's the bad news. The good news, however, is that the kind of radiation they're made out of is protons with energies of about a million volts. And they can be stopped by five inches of water or things that from a nuclear point of view are fundamentally similar to water, such as food or things that water and food become as the mission proceeds. <laughs> and we have enough of that stuff on board to shield a small region of the ship so that when a solar flare happens, the alarm bell rings, you go in there, you're cramped in there like commuters on the New York subway for a few hours. Okay, very similar situation except you probably don't have panhandlers coming through. If you do, you have another problem. Uh, Okay, but anyway, uh, uh, you stay in there for a few hours until the flare ends and then you come out and that's it. End of story. That's how you deal with solar flares. Now the other kind of radiation is cosmic rays. Now these are particles that don't come from the sun. They come from somewhere in interstellar, perhaps even intergalactic space. No one really knows where they come from. And uh, 
they occur not just once in a while in a big rush, they occur all the time as a constant pitter-patter of very high energy radiation. And they're particles with energies not of millions of volts, but billions of volts. So you can't stop it with a few inches of water. You need meters of shielding to stop them. And the mass to support that amount of shielding is unavailable on the ship, so you're going to take the dose. That's the bad news. The good news is that the magnitude of the dose just isn't that big. It's around 50 rem a year for every year you're in interplanetary space in the Earth-Mars region of the solar system. Okay? And you're going to be in space for a year on this mission, then six months out, six months back. When you're on Mars, you can have a lot more shielding from the Martian environment. But, uh, so you're going to take around 50 rem, and that represents about a 1% risk, assuming the linear no-threshold hypothesis. That represents a 1% risk. Okay? It could very well be less than that. Uh, uh, of getting a fatal cancer at, at, at some point later in your life. Uh, now you already have a 20% chance right now, so this would make it 25. Okay? If you smoke, it makes it 40. Okay? So if we recruited the crew from smokers and sent them to Mars without their tobacco, we'd actually be reducing their chance of getting cancer. <laughs> now, the other thing you'll notice about this habitat is um, uh, that in one sense it's a very conventional layout. We've got a table and chairs and shelves and a sink. This thing is designed for use in a gravity environment. Uh, and why? Because we're going to land it on Mars where we're going to have gravity and we're going to use it our house on Mars. And on the way to Mars, next chart, we're going to make gravity by tethering off the burnt out upper stage of the booster that threw us to Mars. This is the Ares upper stage, it threw us to Mars, so it's going to Mars too. It doesn't take any extra fuel to make it go to Mars. It's just a hulk, but could use it as a counterweight on the end of a tether, and you spin this thing up at one RPM, uh, and you can create Mars normal gravity in the hab. And the reason why you do that is to avoid the severe deconditioning that was observed on the cosmonauts during the 1980s and 1990s in long duration space flights on the Mir space station. Okay. Now, however, uh, and I, I still think this is the best way to fly to Mars, artificial gravity to avoid the bone and, and, and muscle loss uh, that the cosmonauts experienced. Uh, you know, you may know that, that whenever they landed after six months or more in space, that they had to uh, come off the, the landing capsule on a stretcher and they were in terrible shape. However, since that time, we have a new data point. Next chart. Here's Shannon Lucid. She's the American astronaut that went to Mir and stayed on Mir for six months last year. Six months is as long as it takes to fly from Earth to Mars. And she walked off the shuttle when she landed. And here she is. This is the day after she landed. She's walking around Johnson Space Center, shaking hands with Dan Golden and Bill Clinton, and she's still not sick. So, so how did she pull... <laughs> You know, uh, according to the media, I mean, they just said, boy, this gal has moxie, and indeed she is someone with a lot of moxie. Shannon is someone who grew up in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. Okay? Mm -hmm. but, the, uh, but it wasn't that alone. What happened was Shannon actually implemented the zero-g countermeasures, which is a program, a, a rigorous exercise, an hour and 20 minutes of hard exercises a day, uh, that was prescribed for the astronauts and the cosmonauts. And she implemented it, and she came down, and she walked off the shuttle in acceptable shape. It turns out that all that data that we had from the Russians over the previous decade and a half on how zero-g countermeasures do not work was false. The cosmonauts were undisciplined. They never implemented the exercises. In fact, they spent a good deal of their time on drinking. That's true. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, so the fact of the matter is, if you're willing to 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 do the the, the discipline of implementing the strict zero g countermeasures, you can endure six months in zero g and and emerge in acceptable condition. However. Uh, I, I still prefer the, the artificial gravity approach. Let's go back to the mission sequence uh, chart. Okay. Uh, okay. They take six months to fly to Mars. When they approach Mars, they fire a pyro boat which cuts the string. They aero brake into Mars orbit and then they go land at site number one where a fully fueled Earth return vehicle is waiting for them. Now, we've been on the ground, robotically speaking, at site number one for two years. We thoroughly explore the areas with robotic rovers, taking pictures of everything that's going to be used to train the crew coming in. We've got a radar beacon on the ground to draw them in. We've got an ace flying this thing. We should be able to land right on the spot. 
You know, just like a helicopter landing, X marks the spot, you're there. Some of you may remember uh, during Apollo, we actually landed an Apollo lunar lander within 200 yards of a surveyor spacecraft that had been put on the moon uh, a couple of years prior. And we got much better guidance systems today. But let's say they fail. Let's say we land 10, 20, 30 miles away, which would be really big piloting errors. We're still OK, because we have with us in the lower deck of the HAB a pressurized ground roving vehicle about the size of a 4x4 that has a one-way driving range of 600 miles. So it would take really piss poor piloting <laughs> to land outside the radius of action of that vehicle. But let's say that happens. Let's say you land on the wrong side of the planet. <laughs> This, this would represent a, 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 a real problem with the pilot selection process at JSC. <laughs> if that were to happen, you can still save the mission because you got the second Earth return vehicle following you out to Mars and you can bring it down near you to land wherever you did land and that one will be done correctly because it will be automated. <laughs> Okay, so that's your third level backup. Finally, is a fourth level backup on the mission. If all of that fails, Fact of the matter is, we got the whole crew landed on Mars. Nobody is left in orbit, so they, everybody's got natural gravity and substantial radiation protection from the Martian environment, and enough supplies with them to last for three years. So if all else fails, they can just tough it out on the surface of Mars until a new launch window opens and more supplies in another Earth return vehicle can be fired out to them at that time. So what we have here is a four-layer defense in depth on the mission, and each layer involves successfully carrying off the mission. But let's say the primary plan works. We go over there, we land at site number one, we check out the Earth return vehicle, you know, kick the tires, everything's great. What do we do with the second Earth return vehicle? Well, we land at somewhere else, site number two. I recommend a few hundred miles away, okay, where it will be used to start making propellant, which it will use to support the next piloted mission, which would fly out there two years later on this chart 2005, along with another Earth return vehicle, which is their backup, but which otherwise can be used to open up site number three. The reason for the a t several hundred mile spread is I want the new Earth return vehicle to open up a substantially new site for exploration, but I would like it to be within the long range driving range of the existing ground transportation. So the crew has available to them two complete Earth return systems, either one of which can get them home. And they have available to them three complete habitations, the big one in their HAB module and the two cabins and the two ERVs to support them in case one or the other should fail. Okay, anyway. So, what do we have here? Two launches every two years is an average launch rate of one per year to support a continuous program of human exploration of Mars. Okay? If we can launch these things at the same rate we launch the shuttles, which is at least six a year, we're talking about using 16% of our available heavy lift launch capability to support this. This is something this country can easily afford to do. Okay, you know, I, you know, given that we have a space program and it's supposed to be exploring space, I, I find the idea that we should at least use 16% of our capability to do that reasonable. Okay, next chart. This is an actual um, uh, photograph of the, um, <laughs> of the Mars base. Uh, there's the Earth return vehicle, the capsule up top, the two... Uh, methane oxygen chemical propulsion stages, the chemical plant built into the landing stage on the bottom. Here's the nuclear reactor and the crater in the background which powers the chemical maker. Here's the tuna cam hab upstairs where they live, lower decks the garage. Here's a um, the pressurized ground rover they used to explore. With uh, 12 tons of methane oxygen that we make for its use, it can go um, 24,000 uh, kilometers, 16,000 miles. That's the amount of exploration we can do in the 500 days we're going to be on the Martian surface exploring. And here's some photovoltaic panels which are backup power in case we ever have to turn the nuke off. And here's an uh, inflatable greenhouse where they're doing experiments in growing crops on Mars. Now, we're going to be on Mars 500 days and we're going to be exploring the planet for two purposes, basically. I mean, there's lots of other things we're going to try to find out, but there's two primary questions that have to do with Mars that we need to know the answers of. Question number one is, was there, or perhaps is there, life on Mars? Okay, everyone here, unless you were on Mars yourself last summer, heard about the Mars meteorite and the evidence for life that was found there by a NASA uh, Stanford Lockheed team. Uh, and that evidence is controversial, although in my personal point of view, fairly strong, although not conclusive. Uh, however, uh, next chart, 
even uh, before that was ever discovered, we had lots of evidence to suggest that we should be looking for life on Mars. See, these are pictures taken of Mars by the Viking orbiter, and there's water erosion features on Mars all over the place. Okay? And in fact, the evidence is very conclusive from, from these sorts of images that Mars was once a warm and wet planet, and was so for a longer period than it took life to originate in the fossil record on Earth. So if the theory is correct, that life is a natural development in water-rich temperate environments, uh, then life should have appeared on Mars, even if it subsequently went extinct. And if we can go to Mars and find direct evidence of this in the form of fossils on Mars, uh, what you'll have proven is that not just that life was on Mars at one time, you'll have proven that life is general throughout the universe. You'll have proven the universe is alive. Because what you'll have done is proven that the origin of life is a high probability event wherever the right temperatures exist. And every star has an appropriate zone for the right temperatures for liquid water. And we're also now seeing that a lot of stars have planets. So it'd be pretty conclusive that when you're looking up in the night star, your sky, you're seeing a million inhabited worlds. On the other hand, if we go to Mars and do some real field exploration here, and at the end of some serious searching, we find no evidence that life ever originated on Mars, then that could send the opposite message, that despite the fact that it was a warm and wet planet and had similar conditions in the Earth for a longer period of time than the Earth took to get life, Mars never developed life. What that could say is that there's an element of freak chance involved in the development of life, which means we could be completely alone in the whole universe. And it's a question of immense philosophical importance, and uh, it's certainly worth the effort to, to find out. Okay, so we're going to go and explore for that. And then at the end of a year and a half of doing this sort of wide-ranging field exploration, we get in that Earth return vehicle, put the key in the ignition, start her up, and head home direct for Earth. We leave the habitat and all the other equipment behind on Mars. That's a good idea. You don't want to bring it back to Earth. We have a lot of stuff here now. The idea of <laughs> doing Mars missions is to bring as much stuff to Mars as you can, leave as much behind, come back with as little as you can. So that next chart, so that at the end of a sequence of missions, this shows a sequence of missions, the circles, the centers of where the landings are, the, uh, the circumferences are, are the radius of actions of the ground vehicles. Uh, you can see, by the way, at the end of eight missions, we'll have succeeded in relocating Texas to Mars. Uh, this appeals to people in Colorado. Uh, no, actually, Texas is just here for scale. But you can see that each one of these missions can explore an area about the size of Texas. Okay? And there's a lot of exploring to do. Okay? And, um, and basically what we're doing here is we're setting up a string of warming huts so you can drive from one to the next, opening up contiguous human territory to human cognizance on a large scale. But after a certain number of these missions have occurred, and I don't know whether it's one or three or twelve or fifty, okay, but eight might be a reasonable guess, you're going to have substantially solved this question number one of whether there ever was life on Mars. You'll have gotten the answer one way or the other and you'll also have some assessment of how far it got. Okay? And then the fundamental question on Mars is going to shift to question number two, which is ultimately the more important question, which is not, was there, is there life on Mars? The most important question on Mars is, next chart, will there be life on Mars? Okay? Because you see, Mars has on it all the elements that are needed to support not just life, but technological civilization. It has the elements of life. It's got a carbon dioxide atmosphere. Nitrogen's the minority constituent of the atmosphere. There's water on Mars, frozen into the soil. It's permafrost, but nevertheless, lots of it. In fact, there's so much permafrost on Mars that if the planet were smoothed over and the permafrost was melted out, you'd have enough water on Mars to put the whole planet under an ocean 600 feet deep. Now, that is dry compared to the Earth. If the Earth was smooth, it would be under 6,000 feet of water, because we are a water planet. Okay, but it is comparable to the Earth without its saltwater oceans. Okay, and it's certainly enough to support a biosphere, and it contrasts very favorably to the Moon. I mean, the Moon is so dry that if there was concrete on the Moon, lunar colonists would mine it to get the water out. Okay. Now, there's lots of water on Mars, and it's got a 24-hour day, and with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and nitrates in the soil, you can grow crops on Mars. Okay? And then you can also, of course, with carbons and hydrogens, you can make plastics. In fact, everything you need on Mars to support a civilization, in principle, is there. But the thing that determines whether something is a just something that's there or something that is actually a, a resource depends not so much on the environment, it depends on you. Two people can be stranded in the woods and, and one can starve to death in two weeks and the other can live there indefinitely in relative comfort. Why? Because one knows how to use the resources that are there and to the other they are invisible. Similarly, Mars. If we go to Mars 
and learn the craft of Mars. Okay, we, yes, in the Mars Direct Mission we start out right, we learn how to make fuel and oxygen out of the atmosphere. But we go beyond that to learning how to extract water from the soil or geothermal power from the subsurface or to make uh, bricks or ceramics or glasses or plastics or metals or wires or tubes or habitats. If we learn the craft of turning Martian resources into useful objects by making that mental transformation in our technological apparatus, we transform Mars into a habitable planet for us and for future generations. We open up a new world to humanity. Okay? And that purpose of that, and that's why you want to have a Mars base. So after a certain number of missions have occurred, you want to uh, concentrate your landings in one location where you'll develop a significant engineering research capability. Now, it'd be nice to have the HABs mated together so you could visit each other without having to get all dressed up and stuff. <laughs> uh, but you can't really land habitats on rocket engines with two feet of clearance. They have to be moved after they're, they're, they're on the ground. Okay, now one way to do it would be to have just jack the halves up one le leg at a time, attach a wheel to each leg and a cable and a windlass to each half, and roll them together and mate them up, uh, and that would work. But another way would be to have second generation halves who, you know, they have six legs, and if you have landing gear that can articulate not only up and down, but also side to side, this would allow the Habs to walk, much as the Martians did in the War of the Worlds. <laughs> and that approach, while perhaps less practical than the other one, has some heritage on Mars uh, there, and therefore it's what's shown here. Next chart. Uh, I won't go into this because um, this is a talk in itself, but the same hardware that's used to build the Mars base can also be used to build a lunar base. You don't need a lunar base to go to Mars. It's not a good stopping off place to go to Mars. Okay? I mean, you know, uh, it's worse than even stopping in Saskatoon. Okay? Uh, uh, it's just out of the way. But it's a good place to go to do astronomy and it makes sense if you want to get both objectives to have hardware that can achieve both objectives and that is the case with this mission architecture. Next slide. So that this is the entire set of equipment you need to establish human beings on both the Moon and Mars. No giant Battlestar Galactica spaceships. No giant spaceports. Okay? Uh, just a good booster with a good throw stage that can throw payloads to either the Moon or Mars. You've got a HAB module that you throw to either the Moon or Mars, you've got to insulate it differently because of a different thermal environment. And you've got an Earth return vehicle that only needs one stage to come back from the Moon because it's a smaller propulsion requirement, two stages to come back from Mars. And you've got an aeroshell module that you would use on Mars. You wouldn't want to use an aeroshell on the Moon uh, unless it was made in a, a politically significant district, uh, <laughs> in which case you might. But this is the set of tools that you need. Okay, and this is not a $400 billion program here. If you want to know, this is about a $20 billion program, roughly speaking, to develop all this hardware and each mission by the copy uh, on the order of between one and a half and $2 billion after the hardware is developed. Okay, $20 billion over 10 years, $2 billion a year is 15% of NASA's budget or less than 1% of the U.S. military budget. And for something that would inspire an entire generation of youth, to, to, to excellence in science education, uh, something that would be a challenge for our, our development of our technology and something that would give a, a new world to our posterity, I think it's a very small price to pay. Next chart. So I'm going to conclude with a quote. This is a quote I lifted from a book called A Plymouth Plantation, which was written by William Bradford. Bradford was, was the leader of the Pilgrims, and he wrote this book in 1621, one year after the Mayflower landing. And, and what he's talking about here is the debate that erupted among the Pilgrims when they were in Holland, and they didn't like the way things were going there, and, and didn't know what to do about it. And some guy came up with this totally bizarre suggestion that what they ought to do about it was relocate the entire congregation from the civilized Netherlands into the wilds in North America, because there, at least, they'd be able to cut their own path. There they'd be able to make their own world. And he says the following. He says, this proposition, relocation to America, being made public and coming to the scanning of all, it raised many variable opinions amongst men and caused many fears and doubts amongst themselves. Some, from their reasons and hopes conceived, labored to stir up and encourage the rest to undertake and prosecute the same. Others, again, out of their fears, objected against it and sought to divert from it, alleging many things, and those neither unreasonable nor unprobable, as that it was a great design and subject to many unconceivable perils and dangers. It was answered that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties and must be both enterprised and overcome with answerable courages. And I put that up there because it's got to be understood that, that that and nothing less than that was the kind of sheer moxie 
that it took to establish European civilization in North America in the first place. And that, and nothing less than that, is going to be what is required to establish humans on Mars. Because, I mean, look, even though I've you know, I just showed you this plan, and even though it's the cheapest Mars mission plan that anyone has ever proposed, I believe it's also the safest because of the relatively small size of the vessels allow them to be integrated completely on the ground where you have the quality control you need. Because I got completely redundant Earth return systems. I got the solar flare storm shelter. I got artificial gravity. I got the capability of making oxygen on Mars to back up the life support system. I got this, that, and the other thing. But there's no question, none, that it is going to be risky. It's going to be very risky when people go to Mars the first time, and that is true whether we do it my way, you know, in 2007, or we leave it to some far future generation of some future civilization to do it in 3007. But if you look at human history, okay, and I don't care whether, when you look, whether it's 1621 or 1944 or 1969, one thing is very clear, and that is that nothing great has ever been accomplished without courage. Thank you. I'll take a few questions and then I'm going to go to the back and sign books and answer questions there. Sir. Dr. Zuber, I read your book. It's great stuff. There's one thing I didn't see in there anywhere, and that is to choose crew members based not on their ability to land planes on the deck, but by their weight. Because it looks to me like the payload would be directly important to the weight of the crew. Well, um, well, I did say in the book that really uh, the pilot skills were kind of low on, on the, the list of, of, of those that you're looking for because piloting only enters into the mission in a very brief amount of time. Uh, the, the main skills you want are, are A, those of the mechanic to fix and maintain the ship, and B, those of field scientists to explore Mars. But uh, certainly if you're using crew members who are smaller, who are in any case, or have slower metabolisms and have a, a lower rate of consumption, that would help a bit. But uh, you know, around the margins, it'd probably be a good idea to do. Next question, sir. Why don't you think about privately funding it? What was Why don't you think about privately funding it? Privately funding. Um, well, it is true that if you did this mission on a private basis, you could do it for a lot less than even $20 billion. It would probably be around $5 billion. <laughs> but that is still a lot of money when it's yours. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> So if you're going to motivate private funding, there's got to be profit. Now, uh, I actually uh, had a meeting with uh, Newt Gingrich, and I had dinner with him. We talked at length about this, and he said he'd like to support it, but he wants to do it in a more free enterprise kind of way than just funding NASA to go to Mars. And what we worked out there was a concept which is described in the book called the Mars Prize Bill. And the idea there is that the government would put up a $20 billion prize for the first privately funded human mission to Mars. And the idea then is to ex excite a private space race that would bring into existence a true minimum cost aerospace industry and get you to Mars for sure for $20 billion and not a penny more as far as the taxpayer is concerned because the cost of the program is the cost of the prize. So that's uh, a one approach and it has a lot of advantages. It has one disadvantage if no one takes the bait, uh, the, uh, there's no mission but then it hasn't cost the taxpayer a penny. But I'd like it a lot. I mean, if they had a prize like that, I'd go see Bill Gates, ask, you know, say, look, Bill, you know, with my brains and your money, you know, lend me your credit card, make it happen. Uh, the, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, but no, that is one model, although um, I believe, you know, under the current administration, a more government-led mo uh, model is, is what would have to be done. So there's different ways you can do this. You can do it with, with government incentivized private funding, or you can do it with straight government or international, as Carl Sagan used to like. I think you, uh, you, you are not putting enough uh, credence in the uh, willingness of people to put up money to for the, just for the exploration. You can make a prize for, as allowing someone to go on a mission who won or if he wasn't physically or whatever, gave to choose someone. There, there's ways to, to make profit 
off of Mars mission directly without a government prize. There's the entertainment rights, there's all sorts of things like that. That would come, no, which are not insubstantial. But I believe given the cost and risk of a program like this, there definitely would have to be a purse there in order to motivate it uh, as, as sort of the, the core of, of your business plan if you wanted to make the sale. I'd, I'd love to be proved wrong on that, but. Uh, Let me give you one other suggestion. Sell lots. All the government then has to do, you have to find a government that will guarantee titles. <laughs> Sell lots. Divide up Mars into 30,000 lots. Give 10,000 of the lots to the government sell the rest of the lots to the public. Well, there, there's, I mean, some people are, are, are laughing, but actually he has a, a good point. The, the, the problem is, is there currently is no regime for guaranteeing private property on Mars. Or, there, there, th that is, but that is, that's a very important thing. There's a lot of space exploration that could be financed today if there was a regime in which you had uh, uh, supported private property rights in space. For example, one could pass a bill guaranteeing the rights to mine asteroids to whoever scanned it to some degree of resolution. Uh, and even though mining asteroids is not practical today, those mining rights would still have trade value today if someone believed that someday they could be mined. Just as Kentucky and Ohio were bought and sold many times more than a hundred years before anybody ever went there. Uh, the, uh, except for a few trailblazers. But anyway, uh, but, but that's something that needs to be worked on. I'll take well, one more question. Sir. Would you have to do an environmental review and how long would that take? <laughs> <laughs> the environmental review on this mission? <laughs> What? Well, you, you would disturb the environment on Mars. <laughs> well, unfortunately, there are people who are trying to make that into a problem. Uh, the claim that bringing Earth microbes to Mars, or perhaps bringing Mars microbes to Earth, could perform, uh, pr uh, create dangers to people or, or biospheres on either planet. That's totally false, though, because the fact of the matter is, see, this Mars rock that landed on Earth, it's not a rare thing. We get about a thousand uh, pounds of these things land on Earth every year. In fact, one killed a dog in Egypt in 1911. Martian meteorites and a similar natural transport of material from Earth to Mars. Every time there's, you know, like the, 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 the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, Mars got sprinkled. Okay, so if there could be forward and back contamination between the planets, because these, this material arrives in a condition that has not been subjected to sufficient trauma to sterilize them of bacteria. Uh, believe it or not, that's true. I've talked to the curator of the samples at Johnson Space Center about that. If Mars could contaminate the Earth, the Earth could contaminate Mars, they've already done it thousands and thousands of times. Anyway, thanks for your attention. I'll be in the back selling books.